Hi, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. This is Brian Sheffy. Good afternoon. This is Donya Williams. How are you guys doing today? Hope you guys are enjoying your Sunday. Yes, today we are. We have questions. We have questions. Get ready. <laughs> so today we're doing DNA. We're talking about DNA and we're talking about DNA with LaBrenda. Once again, Garrett Nelson. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. I want you to get ready, LaBrenda, because I don't know about nobody else, but I got questions. <laughs> and I just can't get my, I, I have to, this is my questions are nothing to type out. They have to be spoken out because it's too confusing. <laughs> well, um, shall I just begin? Because I wanted to uh, just start with some basic stuff. I don't know whether people who are watching now or who might watch in the future, how advanced they are. But well, we're going to be, it's going to, it's, we're going to pretend like they're from begin, mostly beginners. That way it'll be easier to explain it because Brian keeps trying to tell me that I'm more advanced than I, than I believe that I am. But <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, you know, I just feel like I'm not. So I want you to talk to me like I'm a baby, like, I, cause I'm uh, telling you, I can't. <laughs> I think that's a good place to begin because when I first started studying this area, the area of genetic genealogy, it took me quite a while and many webinars and a course, a week long course at an institute and many lectures before I started to get my head around all of this, because it is another field of study that you have to layer on top of what you know about how to do good genealogy. Right. And so that's a good place to start and, and I'll do that. Um, I will, I'll start just by saying that the first DNA test I took, I took for the same reason that many people are still taking them today, which is to find out something about what we now have defined as my biogeographical origins. And those, that, those tests, those early tests that looked at where your uh, ancestors were like 1400 years ago before there was transatlantic travel. And, and those are, um, that kind of leads us into the subject of the types of tests that are available by, to direct to consumers. And there are four, four types of tests, basically, or four types of DNA that can be tested. And two of those are the tests that give you information about that deep ancestry. So one is um, mitochondrial DNA which is the only kind of DNA which is outside the nucleus of the cell. And it is passed by a mother to all of her children, but only females pass it on. And that's important to understand. Each type of DNA has a different kind of inheritance pattern. And you need to understand those inheritance patterns to interpret your results. The second um, type of test, and I took the, so men and women can take a test, can have their mitochondrial DNA tested, but men would not, males would not pass it on. Um, the second type of test, one of the early tests was just looking at Y DNA. And that is one of the 23rd pair of chromosomes, the, I guess, sex determining chromosomes. Um, and it is the Y DNA is only passed from father to son and it mutates kind of more slowly than its companion, the X DNA, but usually it's passed from father to son without change, but it can mutate. So you can have differences between men who descend from the same man, but usually there won't be a lot of differences. And, it's, and the Y DNA tests are useful for figuring out um, relationships within what we call a genealogical time frame, meaning a time frame during which you are likely to find records that corroborate what your DNA is telling you. So there, there are those two types of tests. And then there is the type of tests that all of the direct-to-consumer companies provide, and those are, they're called different things. They're called Family Finder on Family Tree, for example. Um, but those are tests of the first 22 pairs of autosomes that are 
in the nucleus of the cell. And you get half of your autosomes from your father and half from your mother. And what that means is that men and women can take that test when you're figuring out whom to test and what to test. And then the companies usually will also test for the X chromosome if you are testing those first 22 chromosomes. So those are the, like the four types of DNA tests that you can get to work with to try to help you in your genealogical research. And I have to mention that the, um, you guys know that I'm the, the president of the Board for Certification of Genealogy. And we last year published additions or a, a new version of genealogy standards. Now genealogy standards is just a compilation of kind of best practices for not just certified genealogists, but the whole field to use in um, working to meet the genealogical proof standard. And what we did last year was consistent with that. We incorporated best practices from people who have been using this tool of genetic genealogy for the last 20 years. And even though it's been around for about 20 years, it's, it's rapidly changing. You know, new methodologies are being used and uh, publicized. And what we tried to do was to kind of provide guidance for everybody about how you should use this. So one of the first things you have to do, well, it's important to know that DNA alone never proves anything. And I always try to bring that home to people that if you have a parent who's an identical twin, that the areas that the testing companies look at do, do not look at like the, the areas where there may be some differences in the DNA of identical twins. So DNA can't even prove um, who a parent is if the parent has an identical twin. And that's important to keep in mind that before you even begin to look at DNA evidence, you need to have done reasonably exhaustive research and all of the other things that you need to do to, to help you to come to a conclusion apart from the DNA evidence. The DNA evidence you should view as just another source that when you looked at everything else you can look at might reveal evidence to you that's either consistent or inconsistent with the argument or the proof argument that you've already made. And that's really important to, uh, to, to understand. Um, I, like just last week, I, I published an article about using DNA to identify the parents of a freedman. And half of that, it's 27 pages, and half of that is my kind of traditional non-genetic proof argument before I even get to what can DNA do for me. So assuming you've done that and you have a theory or a hypothesis about a question that you want to answer, and just as we do when we're researching um, in, non -tradition, in traditional records, we start with a genealogical question. You don't uh, test people at random just as we don't search records at random. It's always best to have a focused question. So in that article, my focused question was um, who the identity of my second great grandparent, my second Garrett second great grandfather's parents. And we had um, a cousin who said just orally that his son was her grandfather's first cousin. So his father must have been the brother of her uh, of her great grandfather. That's all we had. There was no record that named his parents. He was 30 in his early 30s uh, when the uh, Civil War ended. So he was never enumerated in a household with his parents. There was really no other direct evidence other than the statement by a cousin who never knew him or um, who, you know, her grand great grandfather was dead long before she was born. And that is not enough proof, having an oral statement. Um, but I was able to, to prove the truth of that statement. And, but it took the, the combination of the non-genetic evidence that I had and then carefully working through the genetic evidence. So you start with a genealogical question that you want to answer. And then you have to figure out what tests of the four that I just described would be useful 
in answering that question. And so I'm looking at, you know, my, my subject was my, um, a male, a Garrett male, my second great grandfather. And there are situations where you might be able to trace mitochondrial DNA if he had a documented sister, for example, and, and you could show um, a female descent through her, but we didn't have any of that. So mitochondrial DNA, a mitochondrial DNA test was not gonna be helpful in my particular situation. Um, the same thing on the um, xDNA. There were uh, people I found who shared xDNA, but if you look at the research papers, they didn't share enough for it to be viewed as meaningful, um, and except for one purpose, which I hope to get to. So it, the only two tests that could possibly have been useful to answer my question was looking at those, the tests of those 22 autosomes that men and women can take, and looking at the Y DNA, if I could find at least two men, because you, according to Blaine Benninger, you need at least two people, two men from two independent lines back to the couple that you want to identify in order to do a meaningful Y DNA test. So those are, so I, so you first have to figure that out, what tests might be available. Then you have to figure out, you have to identify people with DNA and the standards kind of lay this out, the, the revised uh, second edition of genealogy standards, you have to identify test takers with DNA with the potential to help you answer your question. And so here I had um, the non-genetic evidence that there was my second great grandfather, there was this um, hypothesized brother descended from this uh, woman, um, uh, the ancestor of the woman who said that he must have been, uh, my second great grandfather must have been his brother. And then we identified a third line and um, a, a one person from a third line who was willing to test because that's the other thing. I identified other people who um, just didn't want to test for whatever reason. Um, and this was, some of these tests were taken before um, the whole issue of law enforcement using different databases to beginning with the identification of that Golden Stick State killer. And what I tell people about that issue, because it's a privacy issue um, in one sense, the concern people have about uh, adding their DNA to a database is that when, especially if you're asking someone to test, you just have to make sure that they understand their privacy rights so that they can make an informed judgment and give you informed consent when they test. Um, and what I did is I asked people to test and I had the test sent directly to them so that they could send it back and they could, um, and, and I just got emails from people saying, yes, you can use my test for the study. Um, so, but that was the first test to try to identify people. You know, I went on GEDmatch and there were people clearly matching descendants of these three hypothesized brothers. And I sent out so many emails and most of them they either didn't respond or they didn't know enough about their own lineages to help me identify folks and whether you know how they might connect. So I ended up with 12 people who were good candidates. And, and one of the people one of the people uh, who tested for me um, was a woman whose grandfather, she's in her late 80s, she's still alive. Her grandfather was a 17-year-old in the household of my third great grandparents, the, the, the ancestral couple whose identity I was trying to prove. Um, so she is like the closest living generational descendant of this couple. And so that would, and, and not surprisingly, she had more of their DNA than anybody else. And she tested like everybody I tested, she tested, she, she matched. Um, and, but then I had other folks. The other thing is that I still think it's true that uh, African Americans, especially those who families that came out of slavery, are underrepresented in the databases, the reference populations that these companies use. But I actually found someone in the database I use who had already tested, who was gracious enough to allow me to include his results in my DNA study and in the article that I published. Um, the if I'm talking too fast, you you know to stop me, right? Because 
No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you in a minute. I want you okay, to get that okay. out. <laughs> so, so <laughs> but I, I, I don't to... know if Brian have may may want to say something, but because I got questions that's popping oh, up, I'm just letting them okay. come up. So, I have an easier question than the yes. one that Sonia has, but yeah. <laughs> so the so I had I ended up with twelve test takers, and I don't think there's a magic number about the number of people you have to test. I think. Um, it has a lot to do with your ability to document those folks. So I hear I had this couple I was trying to prove uh, my descent from, and three three different, um, really two different pools of people. Uh, people in my family where we didn't have, we only had basically indirect evidence, no real record. And this other group that included this closest living generational descendant to compare against. To answer, to try to answer the question whether we were all descended from that couple, and the and and I should mention there were two other people who tested, and I knew them, and I knew and I knew that they were from the same home county, Lawrence, in South Carolina, that we were owned by members of the same white family. It was a Garrett enslaver. Um, they were uh, brothers, but we ha we had no documentation of our relationship with them. And the interesting thing about these two women, two full sisters, is that they matched that closest generational descendant more than any of the rest of us. But we could not document their lineage to the ancestral couple. So I had to weigh the, you know, the um, having a larger pool with having to do a whole lot of explaining about why I, these people should be included. And I ended up just not including them in the study at all, although I mentioned them in a footnote in my article, and that could be the subject of another article. Um, so we have these 12 people and to test. The, and, and so I want to say a few words before you ask any questions about a couple of special considerations that I think um, people who are, who are researching ancestors who were enslaved have to take into account. I mean, we all know the challenges we face you know, that there were severed family ties and voluntary separations, that the records really gave us surnames, like we were happy if they gave us given names. Um, the other thing to take account of is that, uh, especially in Lawrence County and in that whole area of the upstate of South Carolina, which was a rural area and the enslaved population was kind of isolated, in addition to just being limited in the ability to choose mates. So we are accustomed to thinking about those challenges when we do look at traditional genealogical sources. But I just want to focus your attention on what that means when you're using DNA, because there are two things that create additional obstacles. And one is that because of the kind of dearth of records and the fact that we're not going to find an ancestor with a surname and, and easily identify them, um, there are going to be gaps in our pedigree. And we're all going to have them. There's going to be some sale of a person when they were a child, where they don't even remember who their natal, you know, the origins of who their natal family were. That makes for gaps in your pedigree. And if you look at genealogy standards, there is a whole discussion of, of issues that could affect a, a determination about a genetic relationship. And you either have to resolve that issue in some way or offer a rationale for why it does not have an impact or, or, or why it doesn't just why it doesn't detract from your genealogical conclusions, from your conclusions about a genetic relationship. So and, and the thing about it is that this happened during slavery, but into the 20th century, people in rural areas continue marrying in the local population. And the, the thing that that does is that it means that you, it creates the possibility for having more than one common ancestral couple. And that's another factor that could distort your interpretation of genealogical results. Um, and I had, if people get a chance to read my article, I had a situation like that, although I didn't, it didn't have an impact on my, well, if I, if I go can ahead. For just a minute, I think Donnie's question actually touches on what you're just about ready to talk about. Is that right, Donnie? You're going to talk mm -hmm. about being okay. So if you can hold that, we can come back to it. If okay. You no, go go ahead. Okay. Um, my question, which is a real softball one, 
it's a common question that I see um, being asked on uh, Facebook more than anywhere else. So people do autosomal DNA testing on more than one test provider, and then they get confused about why their percentages differ from test service provider. To, can you just talk a little bit about? Yes, I'll talk a very little bit about it because I don't have a chart in front of me, although somewhere among my papers, I have one. There, there are several reasons for that. All of the testing companies and the big ones are Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, what's the third one? Um, 23andMe. 23andMe, of course. So they all have different thresholds, first of all, for when they will even show you a person on your uh, match list as a match. And they differ and, and, and they go from five centimorgans to 20 centimorgans from another company. So that's one possibility. But the other thing is that they all have proprietary, like their own algorithms for even figuring out how related people are. And that makes for differences. Um, and the more you work with this, the more you learn about the the uh, how you can get different results. One of my test takers for my for this DNA study, he and his full brother tested, and his full brother matched a bunch of people in the in the control group, the people who we knew descended from that. He didn't match anyone on Family Tree DNA, and I should mention that I use Family Tree DNA for everyone because Family Tree DNA is still the only company that tests Y DNA and shows you your matches. Um, I think living DNA or something tests Y DNA, but doesn't show you matches. And um, the, but on GEDmatch, um, he, he tested at least one person in the other group. And to even get that match, I had to uh, use one of the tools they have on GEDmatch. And there's a box that I had never checked. You can check it to do what they call a hard break. And all of a sudden, he appears as a match to one of the people in the pool. Um, but, and it was a pretty decent sized match. And the thing about this hard break thing is that, so he was matching over 11 centimeters and, and it didn't show up at first. And when you do those hard break things, it picks up things that could be just areas that they, that are false negatives. So they break it in two and it wouldn't show up if you use seven centimeters as a threshold, but so there are all those kinds of reasons why you might get um, different results. Now, do they also analyze the same amount of DNA, or do they analyze different amounts of? Do, it's um, well, there there are there are several things. There are um, areas that they might. It's not in terms of an amount because it's important to keep in mind that we talk about centimorgans as if it's a kind some kind of physical measurement, and it's not. A centimorgan is a measure of relatedness, but it's a measure of the probability that a given area of your, a chromosome will recombine or change as it's passed from parent to child. And, and this whole area, I should say, is all about probabilities. It's all about probabilities. And in explaining um, the results of my DNA, my Garrett DNA study, for example, when I address all of these issues that especially people coming out of families coming out of slavery will, will um, have, I just focused on reducing the probability that I was misattributing DNA because, for example, of a pedigree gap. If someone didn't have a complete pedigree, um, that presents the possibility that you could be matching not because of the couple you stopped at, but because of some unidentified earlier ancestor. Mm -hmm. That's, and that is why you, um, I'll tell you, when I first started going to lectures, um, and I would listen to folks talk who were talking about, who were, who were white and talking about ancestors in New England and all of that, if I never read another, read anything, I would have come away with the impression that African Americans who came out of slavery can't use this, because we will in, in inevitably we will have pedigree gaps. And what I didn't understand, and this is another thing that the standards tell you about, because they, you're, you're told to, if you're trying to identify a, a common ancestral couple, you should try to complete pedigrees at least back to that couple. 
and, and that's referred to as depth. You have to take into account the depth of each pedigree for each of your test takers. So in my, in my study, for example, I could, my dad, my late father's pedigree, he was one of my test takers. I could, I could complete his pedigree back to that couple and the person who was the closest generational descendant. I could complete her pedigree back to that couple. But, and, and then where I couldn't complete the pedigree, um, there were other things you could point to that again, reduce the probability that you are attributing DNA to someone, um, to some ancestor that you shouldn't attribute it to. For example, by this time, by the time I started doing DNA tests, nearly everybody, people, our family is spread out all over the country. So even this woman who was the closest generational descendant, uh, she was born uh, in Virginia, her father was born in Florida, or her, father, her, her paternal grandfather, one of my Garrett cousins, she only had one grandparent connected to Lawrence County. So all of those factual situations are explanations that explain or reduce the odds that you're misattributing DNA. That's all you're trying to do with all of this stuff. You don't want to, technically we could all be, the, all my 12 testers could be sharing because of some persons or persons generations back beyond that couple. So you do want to try to document as much as you can. And when you get to the point where the documentation ends as it does for many of us, then you start looking at other factors that could explain why your relatedness is probably, most probably attributed to this Garrett DNA in my case. Um, I don't know. Well, right? this, this actually goes right into my question. So um, we have a, a lot of questions. So I don't want you to take a lot of time on it, but, okay. I, really, but, I, but I do want to get it out because this is not just my question. This is somebody else's. So um, basically, I have a grandfather who is actually my fourth, fifth, and sixth great-grandfather. Why is he like that? Because the man had 45 kids. And my mom, we are descendants of him, and he had them with two wives. And we're descendants of both of those wives. Now, I'm breaking this down to you like this because I'm trying to understand why I don't carry more DNA when it comes to certain areas in my family. So for example, like I said, he had 45 children. So it's Tim at the top. He had two wives and I descend from both of those two wives. On one side, um, I had he had a daughter named Martha Ann, who is, at, let's say she's my fourth great grandmother. But on the other side, which is my grandmother's side, he had another daughter named Molly Settles, who is Martha Ann's, who is Martha Ann's daughter. Okay, wait, let me start over. Yeah, I <laughs> No, let me start over. Martha Ann had a sister named Violet. So you got Martha Ann and you got Violet. These are two out of the 40 girls that he had. Both are from different mothers. But one of them is a great, great, like a fourth great grandmother. The other is the third great grandmother. Why don't I carry more DNA? Well, I, I have two things to say about that scenario. And I, I don't know if it's going to answer your specific question, but what you've described is, is something that uh, people sometimes confuse endogamy with uh, pedigree collapse. And it's, in your case, sounds like pedigree collapse where because of, uh, one example is because of uh, the marriage of two related people, you have fewer an ancestors than most people have. For example, we're supposed to have um, eight mm -hmm. great grandparents, 16 great great grandparents, right. but if there is, if, if there's pedigree collapse, you have fewer than, you might have fewer than 16 great great grandparents. Right. So in the first instance, it sounds as if you are dealing with pedigree collapse. And I just want to, because I've heard people still as recently as earlier this year in January, confuse that with endogamy, where the example people usually use are Ashkenazi Jews, where 
people over hundreds of years have intermarried into the same population so frequently that they actually have a genetic signature that can be detected in DNA tests. So it's not endogamy, it's um, more like pedigree collapse. And at the least, it's something that's also addressed in genealogy standards, um, which is just having multiple common ancestral couples. And that's something that falls short of, of uh, pedigree collapse. But well, if it actually, continues, it could turn into pedigree collapse. Yes, Ryan. Uh, actually, you, Donnie, you've got both on the same line because on the white side of the family, there is endogamy because the yeah. same five families are marrying over and over again. Yeah, that's, so that's what I was getting ready family, to say. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're in, terms of why you're not, in terms of why you're not sharing, though, it, it, that the, the short answer is that in every generation, the DNA recombines and, and it recombines randomly. And so it is possible in the example I gave you of the two brothers, they were full brothers. There's no question about that. They, they, they were my first cousins and one of them matched a bunch of people and the other one matched nobody. And that is a, a, a function of how his DNA recombined. The, the brother who matched none of the other group and um, matched my dad, it was like 143 or something like that, sent a mortgage on the X chromosome. And, 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 and I'll mention that the significance of that is that's further proof that he must be um, the brother of, this, of my cousin's mother because that's the only way they could be matching um, on the X chromosome because none of the X ever comes from a man's father's line. Uh, but the other brother, his full brother, didn't match my dad at all on the X chromosome. So it really is re the random recombination of DNA means that down the line, as in the case of my first cousin, even though he's matching all of us in our direct line in expected amounts, did not match any of these other people where his full brother did. So we, we know that he is he too is related to them. So that that's the short answer to your question. So that's why wanted, you want to test wanted, as many people as possible. Yes, so Brian. I just wanted to double check. So because of pedigree collapse on Donnie's Williams side of the family. So for instance, taking the DNA test, she would expect to have a lot more Williams DNA than what she actually has. But because of pedigree collapse, See, that's but, but the take. other issue that comes up. And this came up in my in my test. One of my test takers, the person who was like farthest removed from my third great grandparents, he was uh, my grandfather's sister's great grandson. And he he was he too was was matching that person who's the closest generational descendant. But my Garrett grandfather's uh, sister married into the same family that he did. So. Their descendants are Garrett's and Neely's, and, and my line are Garrett's and Neely's from my Garrett grandfather. And so that cousin who's descended from my grandfather's, my grandfather's sister and my grandmother's uncle, he was sharing more DNA with his Garrett cousins than probably, than it, it, it may have looked as if he was a closer relative because he was sharing through two lines. And, and, you, and there are ways to try to uh, distinguish between the, how, how you're sharing. Um, Paul Woodbury has this algebraic formula he does to figure out how much you should be sharing. Um, and you can, fortunately in my study, I didn't have to figure that out because my comparison was between my line and this other pool of people who could document their descent from the um, common ancestral couple. But that is what can happen. You can either look like you're more closely related than you are because you're sharing through multiple. Um, okay. I'm just not, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I got some more Because imagine how my first cousin feels. He does it like, so he's not on the long chart I have in my article that if you get the cue, you'll see because- I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's so much more to that particular scenario that I was giving you because just to let you know, Violet is the mother of my, my two times great grandfather 
but my two times great grandfather married the granddaughter of Martha Ann. Put it like this: Violet's daughter-in-law is also her niece. So <laughs> they put a great niece or something, right? No, it's her niece. It's her niece. Okay. It's her niece. That's my point. Because, Martha Ann. Just because, uh -huh. just because the common ancestor had a huge number of kids over yeah. a huge. A yeah, he had, he had and the other thing, because I know you're talking about South Carolina. Oh, um, and I know I know this from, I don't know if it's still the law, but I actually took the bar there in 1998. And at that time, first cousins could marry. So yep, they sure could. I don't know if they still can, but that was. Uh, yes, they still I, can. That was news to me. I had only taken the New York bar before, so. Yes, they <laughs> they still can. They still can. But yeah, what Brian is is really what Brian said. He has so many children that they were they were marrying everybody. Well, the other thing is that people, although in your case it sounds like you knew who was who, but in my case, um, I think that there were some marriages between people from. I had always thought there were two Garrett lines, and now I know that there isn't. Because there was some intermarriage between Garrett lines, mm -hmm. but going back much farther than that, I don't. There wasn't. That's that the long. same thing Yolanda says. She's actually been trying to get in touch with you about that too. Um, so we have some other questions because she's a Garrett along with you. She, I think she knows your where you guys match at. But um, so let me get to more questions. Um, this is from Denise. She says, why, I think you've answered this one, why you can't inherit more than half of an ancestor's DNA? Well, this is the thing. If you Wait, I'm sorry. She says, why you can't inherit more than half of an ancestor's DNA at seven generations back or less than oh, one? Okay. That, I think I understand her question. Yeah. Um, depending on whom you talk to, if you talk to people, the, the experts, the real experts, um, They'll tell you some people cut it off at four generations, but certainly nobody goes past six. And that's just because um, if you look at some of the tables, you, you know, you'll say that you, you get 50% from each parent and 25% from a grandparent and 12 and a half. But it's not, it's not always that neat. You can end up getting 30% from one grandparent. Uh -huh. And you're never going to get more than 50% from each parent, but you never know what the mix will be when it comes to what they got from their parents. So right. you lose some of the DNA with every generation. And all uh, studies indicate that certainly after six generations, you could be sharing nothing. So this is the thing. I think um, because for example, on Y DNA, where there, you can do the 111 market test, which is what I did for my father and, and his cousin um which is the what they call the stir test and that's the one that is used most most often in, in make most often in making genealogical conclusions about recent um ancestry common ancestry or you can look at what these big y tests and when i had my guys test it was a big uh big y 500 test now there's a big y 700 test and there i just read something the other day that they are identifying more what they call fast mutating markers on the Y chromosome, and that that work can make the Y test more useful going back a, a, a longer period of years. Um, but normally, um, because of random recombination, again, um, you know, you could end up just like my, you don't even have to wait that long. I, I continue using my first cousin as an example where he, his full brother matches a bunch of people that he does not match outside of in, in the other lines because he didn't happen to get the combination of DNA that his brother got. And the more time that passes, the more likely that is that you'll have less and less of the, of the ancestor's DNA. Okay, so I have another question. Are there markers within the mitochondrial DNA and Y DNA that the autosomal DNA can assist in proof of well, a genetic relationship. Absolutely, and that's the other thing I should mention that people should keep in mind, that you, you really shouldn't use Y-DNA and mitochondrial alone. 
you really should try to combine it with the autosomal DNA, the mitochondrial DNA in particular, because it is really uh, mutates very, very slowly. So you could be matching someone because of an ancestor really hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And that's true of the Y DNA also. You cannot tell um, how recent your common parentage is. But in, in my case, for example, I had um, my dad and my late dad and his cousin, who was a third cousin once removed. There were three differences, which on a 111 marker test means that they were related pretty closely. And one of those differences was one of those identified fast mutating markers, which meant that you could kind of discount the fact that there was a difference because it was more likely to change within a genealogical time frame. And another uh, result of their Y-DNA test was that there was one uh, marker where they each had a zero value. They call it a null value. Mm -hmm. And a null value is another kind of mutation that's also passed from father to son, and it's rare. There are some sub-branches where it's, it's more frequent than others, but that was further proof combined with how they were matching on the autosomes that not only did, do they just, did they descend from a common male ancestor, but that they were genetically related. But the Y test, neither the Y test nor the mitochondrial test can tell you exactly how you're related. Okay. Um, this is from Awa, a, 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 Yo, Yawa, Yawa Evans. She says, I'm a DNA tested female with one paternal male first cousin tested and at brick wall on our paternal great grandparents who were enslaved on three branches. Is there a way to discover our unknown? Um, so uh, I want to make sure I understand your question. So she knows uh, how many, she, she knows, knows that he is, parents? she said he is, um, she's a DNA tested female and she right. has one paternal male first cousin who's tested and their brick wall is on their paternal great grandparents who were enslaved on three branches. Okay, so your paternal great, so the, her father's grandparents. So it sounds like a very similar circumstance to what you opened up the show with, saying that you were matching this first cousin. Um, so you know. she, is the first cousin a match? Yeah, this, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming so. This is, this is Brian, why, why I try to start out slow for folks mm -hmm. to try to explain. She's trying to identify one of four great grandparents. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like. And, and is there a way to do that? Do she she probably so, needs to test more people. Well, not only that, she needs to do more actual research. So she knows four of the great grandparents on, on that line. I don't know. So it's, it's, her question needs to be a little bit more clear. Okay. No, I guess what, I guess the way that I was hearing it, it just resonated with what um, what was being discussed, what Lebrenda was saying at the, the top of the show, mm -hmm. about how he and this close this closely matching cousin were trying to figure out whether there was a common ancestor. So I guess the way that I'm hearing the hearing that question was exactly what. Brenda spent so much time opening the show, kind of discussing her methodology. So, and, and, if, if that, so if the two situations are very similar, I would just invite the the viewer to rewatch the beginning with them um, with Lebrenda. And again, because you were saying about working the records too. Right, you have to. You really have to do all of that work before you even can identify people to test to test. How do you even know? whose DNA test results would be useful to you if you haven't done all of the work in the records. Yeah. And, and, and if people don't have all of that work done, you have to do that work. Because does the viewer also know who enslaved the different branches of the same family? Because that, that's going to be important. Right. Those that, that's that's the different. basic documentary work that you need to do before exactly. you even begin to think about DNA. I, I really wish in, in my article that, that got published last week in the National Genealogical Society Quarterly, I really wrote it in mind um, with providing guidance to people about how you do this because 
and and I, and I didn't, it's not a how to, it, it's not written that way, but that is what I had in mind and kind of laying out my steps. And as I said, half of the article is what I did to try to document as much as I could before I even began to think about DNA tests. Mm. Which is really excellent advice. And I'm going to say that it's a very similar coin. In order for me to prove that Patrick Henry was my seven times great grandfather, I think I've got that correct. Um, I had to basically have my, ans my ancestor, George, George Roan, being born in Spencer Roan, who's the husband of Anne Henry, in that household. I got the paper trail going all the way back to him. They, that they is exactly have... right. You will see um, in my article, there's a footnote because there is a, uh, a woman who's a history professor, I won't say her name, but she claims one of my ancestors. And the thing is, is that um, she, because in addition to my third great grandparents, that couple, I have identified the parents of both of them. So the parents of my third great grandmother included a woman that I can track pretty closely. I can see where she was, uh, her, she, her mother and her four siblings were the subject of an 1823 equity court case when the heirs of the enslaver were fighting over her. And the case, the, the uh, pleadings in the case state very clearly that her mother was bought as a two-year-old in Virginia and brought to Lawrence County. And that she's the mother of all these children. So depending on whether the, they were asking the court to decide whether the mother belonged to the um, decedent enslaver or his widow who was trying to treat this woman and her children as her property and distribute it under her will. And, and so the pleadings tell us she was born as a two-year-old. She remained in the custody of the widow or the widow's son for the next 20 odd years until they arrived at this case. She was, uh, my third great grandmother was bought as an eight year old out of the estate. So we have all of this stuff. And then someone claims in a book in, a, in the introduction to a book that her mother spent time in Jamaica before being brought to Lawrence County and with no documentation, mind you. Uh, so all of that's important. I didn't just look at tracing them back to their enslaver. I tried to, I documented as much as I could about their lines. Um, right. Where the standards tell you to at least try to go to the depth of the couple you're trying to prove. Okay, I got another question for you. Um, what is, because we're, we're, hey, this is already 12 minutes left in the show. <laughs> um, what is considered significant for XDNA? Um, I've always um, read that, uh, I know that there were people from two different lines in my study, and they were sharing three point something, and I and, and found a white paper that said that that's in, insignificant. My, my father and his nephew were sharing 143 centimorphs. Oh, okay. And that yeah. was, but I know, I think on the, on the X, they do require a higher threshold before they treat it as significant. And again, all of this, you should try to use both to autosomal and these other kinds of DNA. It's, you know, because, especially because the Y and mitochondrial tell you nothing about the actual relationship of people who might be exact matches. Okay. Um, trying to find another one. Okay, this one is from Jay Spears. He says, great show. Have you ever seen a case where Y-DNA was successfully used to help confirm Native American ancestry? What in your view would it take to su successfully use Y-DNA in situations like this? Thanks. Um, so the short answer in terms of whether I've seen, personally seen such a case, no, however, the thing I always read read about, and it kind of resonates with me, is that um, even if you show that you're sharing Native American DNA with someone, and, and it's my understanding that there aren't a lot of Native Americans in these databases for whatever reason, but even mm -hmm. when they can, when you show that, um, it doesn't tell you like you're a member of any particular tribe. Does it? Will not entitle you to uh, membership 
uh, in a tribe, that there's so much else that goes into that. The other thing that um, to keep in mind is that, you know, that Native Americans were kind of pushed westward. So when I see evidence of that, and I see it in my own DNA, it's usually it's like one to 2%, which is consistent with the time period during which Native Americans were kind of pushed out of the Carolinas and just continue to be pushed westward. So it's dating back, the smaller the percentage, it's dating back a couple of hundred years, it's dating back to the you know, early 1700s or something. But the short answer to your question is that I haven't seen that. Um, and if you do see it, I, I think in my article, I cite this paper that I haven't seen cited a, a lot, but as far as I know, there's only one peer reviewed scientific paper of, that studied the genome of African American families that came out of, of slavery. And it also included white people in that study. And there's all kinds of great statistics in there. And, they, and, and that's the, the uh, conclusion that they came to, that just as every family that came out of slavery has some appreciable amount of European DNA, we all have one to two percent of most of us of Native American DNA. And, okay. and it was from years and years ago that. Okay. I mean, if you jump in on that one, I think the best that he can hope for with Y DNA is to show that he, a probability right. that he is descended from a specific male, and then he will need to get the paper trail, local history, you know, local history books, local history kind of genealogical societies to find out more about that specific ancestor. You're right. I wasn't really answering his questions because I was focusing more on the autosomal. So no. yeah, I think, yeah, the Y DNA should tell you, should be able to pinpoint if you share that particular haplogroup. Okay. Exactly. Um, you have to do more research. Thank you, Brian. I was going, going on and on. <laughs> Just... <laughs> okay. Uh, so then there's one, there are eight males. There are eight male first cousins that descend from this is from Tanisha Watson. There are eight male first cousins that descend from her grandfather. Is a Y DNA test necessary for all of them to establish a paternal third, fourth, or fifth great grandfather? Well, two things. Now, are they all descend? Are they are these first cousins all the sons of sons? That would be because that would make a it's not enough to say they're eight male first cousins because only the sons of your grandfather's sons would have the Y DNA. Right. Um, again, if I don't say, uh, forgive me if I sound like a broken record, but it's really impossible to say how you will identify a first, second, or third, or fourth great grandfather unless you've done documentary work. You have some idea yes, of who you're looking true. for. You need some basis for a, 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 quite a research question to answer to use this stuff. Okay. You know, it's not, you, these, these names, they're not labeled by name and relationship. They are. They are. You do your research and then you take these tests and you see whether the DNA evidence is consistent with and, and therefore supports your conclusions based on the non-genetic evidence. That's how you must approach this. Okay. So in, in short, you definitely need to do your research first before you start getting into DNA. Yeah. Can I just give a really, I promise it's going to be a really quick example. Yeah. Right. My, second. my maternal great, my maternal grandfather. Now we thought he was a Turner, biologically a Turner, did the DNA test, quickly realized that he wasn't a Turner, he was actually a cone. But the only reason why we could even work that out is because I had done such extensive work on his Turner family, which I thought was his family. And when we went into the DNA results, none of them were in there. But there were all these cones. I mean, for me, it was easier because the cones were Jewish and they're the only Jewish ancestors that I have within the last, say, five generations. And see, so that's the kind of fact that would help you explain the probability that you got it right. These are your only Jewish ancestors. In my hometown, I don't think, I don't even think there's a synagogue in the town I was born in, in South Carolina. So if you, but there were some Jewish families there. So the, the, the odds of there being anyone, but yeah. Yeah. But, so, but what made that easier is the documentary, the documentary and research 
for the family he wasn't a biological descendant of had already been done. That just made the whole process easier. So I think Donnie has, Donnie has another question for us. Yes. Um, so Nicole House said, any class you recommend taking to help understanding the basics of understanding the chromosomes? She's lost and basically so am I. Okay, so so yeah. let me tell you that you have, it's 5, a, it's 5 p.m. And this weekend, beginning on Friday morning, Legacy Family Tree, they were, they're doing free weekends in June. And this weekend was African American weekend. And I did a webinar that they've just been made available all week. So after we finish, go to legacy uh, webinars and you may have to just sign in with your, um, uh, an email and your name, but you can uh, access a webinar that I just taped like a week ago that they've been running all weekend. Also, you doesn't, doesn't so, ISOG doesn't Isog or East, um, Eastman, who's the other genetic genealogist, and uh, Roberta? You're thinking Edwards. of, you're thinking of um, uh, well, Blaine Bettinger is a genetic genealogist. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if she wants a webinar that tries to, that she can like listen to over and over again, you have about seven hours okay. to listen to me on legacy webinars for free. Sure. I was thinking because about After, after thinking this about week, books. I think. Well, she, she asked for webinars. A webinar, okay. Webinars, webinar people may not be book people. Yes. <laughs> well, you have um, definitely, we're three minutes before close, and you have definitely answered a lot of questions, but there's still so many up here. So I would appreciate it, and I know Brian would appreciate it, if you were to get on here and well, scroll through here. these comments and pray Thank you. I so appreciate it. And you and I need to talk some more about mine. Because well, how I'm do you feel to... now? You said that Brian's been telling you you know more than you think you know. How do you feel about that? You feel like I'm a kid at it. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> well, I say that because I, you know, I bounce these kind of genetic genealogy stuff to Donya. You get it. You get it. I mean, I get it. Yeah, but it's just, I guess I, I start to... It's Moses, man. It's Moses. I'm telling you, him and his up teen thousand children and all of them marrying everybody and all of the families being connected. And I, I mean, it's, it's, it's too many people. And I, I sometimes I just wonder, you know, well, we just there's a reason why Brent, not Brenda, um, Bernice and, and all of them, they called my mother Eve. Because when I did my mom's DNA in 2013, when I tell you, LaBrenda, she matched every surname in Edgefield, Newberry, Lawrence. I mean, she matched every surname. But it's just, our, <laughs> when you think about it, old 96 isn't any different than being a Hasidic Jewish family or being a family that was you know, living... The only in difference, Brian, let me point this out, and I point this out in my article, is that the, they didn't start to settle that area until after the last Indi Native Americans were, were driven out, like in the late 1760s. So yeah. unlike other parts of the South, where people had a couple of hundred years mm -hmm. to intermarry, really people, we were brought down from Virginia, from Virginia most of us, and only had about a hundred years before the Civil War for that stuff to go on. That's why it doesn't quite reach the level of endogamy in the way it looks you. But our but our family does because they were marrying the same five or six families. Yeah, in so that's yeah, yeah, that's they bordering going back on. They, they were doing it. In they were doing it in Virginia or Harlem's. They were doing it in England, Northern oh, Ireland, yeah. Pennsylvania, Virginia, and South Carolina. Yeah, it was a mess. Same family. So but, that's but, that's just it's just our crazy family, Donia. Yeah, but I want to thank you, Brenda, for coming, and we are one minute out. The show Thank is you just for about having to end. me. And um, I'll, I'll scroll through the question. Congratulations <laughs> on your article as well. Um, I think you've posted it, so we may be able to, you know, reshare it. Well, actually, I think when I posted, there was an article in the um, in the NGS mo monthly about something I posted about my great grandfather, who's on the cover of this month's issue of the right. Right. But I hope but, you can get a chance to look at it to get a sense for the amount of documentation that's required when you're using DNA. 
Okay. And I was also going to say, LaBrenda, if it makes it easier for you to answer some of the comments, because you have so many webinars and videos and, um, and articles, I mean, feel, um, instead of maybe having to give a full answer, just drop a link if it's okay. appropriate. Yeah, yeah. the legacy link. Thank you, so, guys. You, you're very welcome. Brian, you want to? Uh... So thank you so much for, um, for joining us this week. Thank you, everyone at home, for joining us. Next week, Donnie and I are actually taking our Sunday off. We're having a Sunday to ourselves. Um, we're going to rerun the Jane Elliott show for next week. So you can still tune in. You can catch that show if you haven't seen it. Donnie, anything you wanted to add? No, that's it. Um, thank you guys again for coming in. And I hope we got at least some of the most important questions that kind of covered everybody. I tried my best. I really did. Um, so yeah, enjoy your Sunday. I'm Donya. I'm Brian. And this is LaBrenda. You guys have a great day. Bye.